Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Ryan Tan and I'm here with the team at LawPath uh, and we've actually got a special guest, uh, Pop Business with us today. And we're gonna be going through uh, a live webinar on budgeting tricks that can help you save in the changing climate. Um, so especially during these times with inflation, um, budgeting is uh, more important than ever. Um, so again, we've got our friends at Pop Business, we've got uh, James and we've got Pat as well here on the line. Um, they're going to be Guys. doing a presentation. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to be doing a presentation on uh, budgeting tricks. So just while everyone starts pouring in, um, if you can let us know in the chat, now let us know your name, uh, where you're from and what business line you're in. Uh, we tend to have a lot of different businesses here, not just service professionals, uh, but people in the entertainment industry. Uh, food and beverage and the like. Um, so it could be a good networking opportunity. So just a uh, key that in the chat. And while everyone is still pouring in, I'm going to pop up a poll here. Uh, it's got five different questions. Uh, and this is really just allowing us to customize the webinar so it can best meet the needs of your business right now with budgeting. So I've just launched that poll uh, that's come up now. So again, just take a few seconds there to fill in those five questions and let us know uh, your company's biggest focus, and again, how we can make this webinar relevant to you. Now, just while we go through that, uh, today's agenda, we're going to be going through uh, Law Park. So what do we do and how can we help your business? And then we'll be going uh, and introducing you onto the team at Pop Business. So again, we've got Pat and James on the line, um, and they'll be going through uh, budgeting. Um, so again, different topics that we'll cover today is possible challenges that businesses may be facing. So in these inflationary times, how can you control costs and um, keep budgets uh, in line as well as forecasting? And also, again, how you can prepare yourself uh, again for the next six months. Um, equally, you know, forecasting is something that is important to do alongside this. And then they'll also cap off a range of different grants that may be available to you as well. So definitely stick around for that. Um, and then towards the end, we'll do a question and answer time. So if you have any specific questions on budgeting or uh, questions for uh, James and Pat to go through, uh, they can definitely do it. And we'll have a ask me anything at the end of the presentation. So thank you for everyone who's been filling out the poll and who's popped some questions um, in the Q&A already. Uh, hello to, to Jamie. Thank you for joining the webinar. So I just wanted to start off uh, about Law Path and what do we do? So if you're on this webinar, you're probably familiar uh, with what, we've, what we do in a nutshell, but we provide smart, simple legal for small businesses. Uh, and we aim to make legal more accessible for the average small business. Um, so we're a platform where you can create legal documents to manage your compliance, and you can connect with lawyers on demand in a simple platform. And again, this is our whole mission. It's around making legals more accessible for the average small business owner um, so that you know, they can easily access the documents, the contracts that they need, but also the advice, not only from a legal standpoint, but from an accounting standpoint. Um, so as you can see below, we've got over 10,000 reviews uh, that are five star on Trustpilot, uh, a bit more on Google. We've assisted over 300,000 businesses. And not only that, but one of the coolest stats here is that we've saved small businesses over $100 million in legal fees. Um, and this is always growing as we grow. So how can Law Path help? Well, firstly, we've got contract management for your business. So this is accessible through our documents library where we have over 350 different legal templates uh, for your business. Anything from employment agreements, to shareholder agreements, uh, if you need anything to do with uh, business structure or trust or deeds to do with that, um, they're all on the platform and easily customizable uh, with your company's branding. So that's definitely uh, one main one point that we do. Um, but secondly, we have personalized workflows on a range of different topics. So whether you're looking to hire an employee, uh, to fire an employee, to collect a debt or simply register a trademark, we have personalized workflows that can walk you through all the legal and non-legal steps to guide you through the process and to ensure that you can remain compliant. And then lastly, we have uh, legal consultations and on-demand legal and accounting advice, uh, which is fantastic because again, having access to the documents is, is phenomenal and it's a time saver. But if you have any questions or queries on the specific documents, or you just want to get uh, you know, the lawyer or the accountant's eyes to make sure that you've done everything correctly and you're fully compliant. Um, that's where we come in with our on-demand legal and accounting consultations. So I just want to hand it over 
to uh, James and Patrick now. They're with Pop Business and uh, Pop Business are fantastic. We have a partnership with them uh, and they do a lot of the work uh, for our accounting clients. So if you ever come to Law Path and you need any accounting queries, you'll be dealing with the team at Pop Business. Um, but again, they are phenomenal. They are one of uh, Australia's most highly sought after chartered accountants. So again, extremely qualified and always happy to help. So I'll pass it over to you now, Patrick. Excellent. Thank you for the, the warm introduction and hello everybody. I hope we can um, give you a lot of value in this, this webinar and give you some great tips for um, you know, the current market conditions. And we're gonna go through some budgeting, some forecasting, some, um, some challenges that you might face. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the current market and, and kind of what we're seeing and, and give a bit of an economic um, sort of overview of what's, what's happening in the, the market as a whole. Um, so we'll get started on that. So I, I think the common theme in the market now is, is definitely inflation's here. So what is inflation? So inflation is an increase in prices, um, put, put simply. And I think you'll see that when you go to the, the, um, the fuel, fuel, fuel bowser and you put some fuel in your car or you look at your electricity bill, um, you, might, you, know, you might see lettuce at $10. So yeah, all these things are contributing um, to, to, to the increase in prices. Um, it's generally caused by most recently there's been COVID-19 and there's been the war. And so those two things have been the catalyst for inflation. And they, they've, they've, they've brought inflation around based on two different things. One is there's a lot of money. So there's an increase in the cash supply. So the government's pumped a lot of cash into the market. So that everyone's been pretty flush with cash. Um, secondly is there supply chain issues. So there's been, um, you know, the, the war and all these bits and pieces have caused, and COVID-19 is COVID as well, have caused supply chain issues, which has caused delays in getting goods and services into the country. And you'll see that like the car, secondhand motor vehicles are going up because we can't get cars. Um, you know, the cost of fuel's gone up because we can't get fuel. Um, transport costs have gone up. So there's all these um, supply chain issues, food as well. Um, so basically supply chain issues an increase in cash in the in the economy has has created um, sort of too much demand and not enough supply. So what we're seeing is prices are increasing and the cost of things have gotten more expensive. Um, so that's basically what's happening in the current market. And as you'll see, inflation's sort of skyrocketing at the moment, and it's probably going to continue for a little bit. And over the next year, um, hopefully, we'll see it start start to come off. So the government um, is putting together some monetary policy to slow inflation because what we want to do is contract the market a little bit. We want to reduce the demand so it can match to the supply. So the, the price of the goods and services come, can come down a bit um, and, and you know, get a bit in line with you know, the this, this set targeted inflation rate of say two to 3% um, per annum. So one, one point on inflation is it's, de it's definitely not good for business. Um, in general for most businesses, but also it's not necessarily a bad thing. So when you see, um, we've had like really record low interest rates and we've had massive surge in prices of property in the share market, that sort of redistributes wealth to the, the wealthy and, and makes the poor poorer. So as a society, it's not necessarily a good thing given the, the in those times where there's record low rates and there's skyrocketing asset prices, um, the wealthy people invest and the, the, the lower sort of, sort of socio, um, eco, the, the lower sort of society in the economy, they're savers and, and they're spenders as well. So typically the, the, the wealth gap broadens. And so inflation is definitely not a bad thing, um, but for businesses, it creates a lot of challenges because now your costs are more expensive. So the cost of doing business is more, is more expensive. Demand decreases. So your, your customer base in general decreases. Um, there's less cash. So they're trying to reduce the cash supply in the economy and um, things just get more expensive and people have less money. So what we need to do is create some strategies for you as a business owner to get through this period um, and come out on the other side. One more point is it creates a lot of opportunity. So in times of inflation, that's where the best sort of um, innovation comes out where, where things do get more expensive and you need to sort of look at ways to increase efficiencies or look at ways to do new things, look at technology, 
Um, so it does breed innovation. Um, so it's definitely not purely a bad thing, but it def definitely causes a lot of challenges for businesses. So hopefully we can provide some solutions to you over this, this coming period. Um, one key thing we're seeing is interest rate rising, interest rates rising as well. Um, and that's a lot of businesses have debt. And so that makes it worse for businesses because now the repayments have increased. Um, it also affects the, the demand within the market. So what the government does is they increase the interest rates to try and reduce the amount of savings people have to reduce the demand of buying goods and services so that the price can come down a bit. So as I mentioned, it's this demand matching supply. There's too much demand, not enough to supply. They're, decre they're contracting the market. They're decreasing the cash within the market so that the supply can match the demand. How are they doing that? So the government's raising rates. Uh, most people, you know, a lot of the country have mortgages. The good thing about Australia, well, I don't know if it's a, such a good thing, but one positive thing is a lot of the interest rates, a lot of the home loans are on variable rates, which means when the government does increase rates, it has an immediate impact. So people feel that instantly because all of a sudden they got less cash because they're paying their, their mortgages on a monthly basis. Economies like the USA, they've got a lot of like 20 year fixed rate loans. So um, it's a lot harder for them to control inflation because when they raise rates, um, you know, it's got a lag effect and, and it doesn't, because there's so much fixed interest rates, um, it doesn't really do as much to the market. So they need to raise rates a lot faster and a lot more aggressively over a longer time. Whereas Australia um, is probably gonna raise rates really quickly, scare the market, um, and then they might taper it off by the end of the year, hopefully, and, and you'll see it sort of flatten out. And um, I suppose the one thing they're trying to do is not make us go in a recession, because when you're trying to contract the market and demand's decreasing, your GDP's decreasing, and so it's a balancing act, right? They're trying to contract the market without causing a recession. So they still wanna have healthy growth, but they don't wanna have um, too, much, too much growth. And I think like rising wages and record unemployment sort of driving this as well. So um, monetary policy wise, the government's raising rates and they're trying to contract the market a little bit, reduce the spending. Um, and, and that, that affects businesses, so that affects you, because if you're selling a good and service, um, then might, you might find that your market size is decreasing, and you might find that there's less customers for you, and you're sort of, you know, fighting for less customers. Again, that's a generalization. You might be in a business where in times of inflation, your, your market grows because you've, you, you know, you might be having a business that takes advantage of these current climate. Um, but in general, um, it's definitely gonna be a bit tougher for businesses over the next six to, to 12 months. Do you wanna go to the next slide? And then I suppose one of the, the, the key, key issues that we're, we're facing is the forecasting complexities. So you wanna budget for your business. And we had someone in the chat um, already mentioned how to best budget for whether they're gonna receive funding or not. And um, I suppose that's, that's one of the complexities that we're currently facing, right? So it's, um, it's hard to forecast costs when costs are rising and we don't know how much they're gonna rise by. And it's hard to forecast um, you know, your, your expenses and even your income, and it could be um, your sales or the cost per acquisition of a client. Things are changing because of the de demands decreasing. Um, so the, for the complexities in your forecasting become a lot more real and a lot more difficult. And um, you need to, obviously put a bit more thought into your forecast to make sure that you're, um, bu you know, you're having different buffers for different scenarios to allow you to, um, you know, factor in all these complexities and the difficulties that come with, um, you know, forecasting the future in such an uncertain time. Cool, so we'll just touch on how to prepare yourself for the downturn. We've got a few really interesting tips and strategies. And then James is gonna sort of talk about some, um, some strategies within cash, the, the cash flow forecast. Um, so the key thing is to review your business costs and especially those that are affected most during this, this, this period. There's obviously your business is gonna have, and we get to this in a little bit, like what's your business strategy over the next year? And that di dictates what your business costs are gonna be. Um, so it's really important that you have a clear strategy for the next year within this current market so that your business costs match to your strategy. 
Um, you've obviously got some business costs that are necessities. Um, you might have some that aren't necessities and they're more feature driven and they're good to have and they do help and long term they might be a good idea. Um, but in the short term, are they, are they a good idea? And that's where you've got to you know, have a good honest look at your business costs and it could be looking at your business strategy and you might have a defensive business strategy, which I'll touch on in a bit, and you might reduce some of those costs that you think aren't necessary over the next six to 12 months, given the uncertainty of the increase in your other costs within your business. Outsourcing is a big one. So we're seeing a lot of businesses, um, we've had a lot of wage growth recently, and that's triggered, um, you know, price increases across a lot of industries and businesses, which is further fueling inflation. Um, but there has been some wage growth. And, you know, this is where the efficiencies and opportunities come into it. So, you know, what activities can you outsource? Um, can you find labor in good quality labor in, um, you know, other economies that can help your business, whether it be admin, marketing, sales, um, you know, it could, it could be software development, um, UX, UI. So, you know, reviewing your wage costs and looking at your activities that you're working on, tying that back to your business strategy, um, and then reviewing is outsourcing an option to streamline your business, um, increase your efficiencies and reduce your costs. Um, so that's a really key one. Um, Reviewing your subscriptions. So this is a really common one. A lot of businesses just have tons of subscriptions to different things and they don't really keep a track of them. It's, it's probably a good time now to really narrow that down and reduce your unnecessary subscriptions. So if something isn't directly driving sales or driving the, the delivery of your service or goods, um, that's definitely something I'd be looking at in the next six to 12 months just whilst we ride through this, this current period. Regular reviews is probably the most important. So the market conditions is going to change regularly and you really need to be doing regular reviews. Um, we recommend monthly meetings with your accountant or advisor just to allow you to sort of have a really good grip on, you know, what are your costs within your business? How's your, what's your profitability? Um, how are you tracking your business costs? Um, are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Um, where's the opportunities? And so regular reviews provide sort of a snapshot of your financial performance and your financial position. Um, so what's your liquidity in your business? Do you have enough cash? Um, where should you be spending your money? And, and so these are the sort of things within a, a regular review you'd, you'd come up with. And it would really just help you keep a grasp on your monthly expenses to ensure that you're well positioned and you're taking advantage of the, the current opportunities. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Pat. Also, also on this point, um, it, this might be a very obvious tip, but you know, as a business, you want to keep communication with your suppliers and your customers strong during this time. So, what I mean by that is, you know, before starting a job, make sure you, you know, you sort of reiterate with your customer what your payment terms are, and ensure that you know they're in a position to pay you on time before you even commence a job that's a, that'd be an important like a sort of important um thing to an exercise to go through with your customers um because you the last thing you want to be doing is you know expending labor expending time completing a job and you're not getting paid on time especially during these times right also Definitely. keeping you know maybe potentially negotiating um better payment terms with your suppliers as well so um yeah you know everyone's going through the same thing right now. So just have a chat with your suppliers and say, hey, is there any, any room for extending, you know, my payment terms an extra 10 days? You know, that would really sort of help your cash flow um, in, in a given period. So yeah, just open communication with, you know, all your stakeholders in your business. That would be um, a very um, useful exercise to go through as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely agree. And um, yeah, you can, there's definitely going to be some good tips in this, this cash flow. And Getting paid on time is, is the most important thing, really, um, especially if you're expending costs to, to get the money. And it could be, um, you know, getting paid up front, um, taking deposits. It could be having more payment options, like um, making sure you can accept online payments. So there's all these different things you can do to make sure you, you're you getting paid. Um, and yeah, with your pricing, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. So you've really got to look at like people just say increased pricing during inflation because you've got rising costs, but you've, you've really got to look at where you're positioned in the market. Um, are you a 
Are you a low cost product? Is there much competition? Are you a premium product? How are you doing your pricing? Is it a cost plus or are you doing value pricing? Um, are you just, you know, doing it in line with, with sort of where you sit within the competition? Um, so definitely your pricing does need to get reviewed and it's worthwhile increasing your pricing because you've got more costs in your business. Um, but you, you really need to make sure that um, for one, you've got to give your customers notice of a pricing increase. And, um, and I think secondly is just making sure that when you're doing a pricing increase, you're doing it um, with, with the sort of front of mind is customer attention. So you don't want to lose any customers that you want to keep. So that's a key one. And also um, I think there's market positioning. So making sure you're increasing your pricing and you're sitting where you want to sit within the market. And that comes back to, you know, you've got quality, you've got people, you've got price. And so it's really identifying which ones um, you're willing to like push really hard on. Um, if you've got great quality, great people, definitely you might be a bit more premium. If you've got a lower cost product um, or a less quality or you, you, you know, then obviously you might be positioned a bit different and that could be purely because you want to hit volume and you're a volume type business first, high quality, less clients. So really depends where you're sitting in the market, but reviewing pricing is absolutely critical whilst you've got rising costs because your profit margins are definitely going to get hit. And if you don't increase your prices, um, you know, you could be trading at a loss without doing regular reviews and, and keeping on top of things. That's right. Yeah. So just following on that previous slide, um, you know, it's all great to sort of do all these reviews and, and generate these cost cutting strategies, but you want to see what effect this has on your actual cash balance, right? You want a tangible figure in order to see, hey, if I cut all these costs, how much cash is that really going to save me? So that brings us on to our next tip, which is actually doing a cash flow forecast. So just put simply, what is a cash flow forecast or what is cash flow forecasting? Uh, it's, I, the way I define it is it's an exercise that a business owner goes through where they estimate the cash inflows and outflows um, in their business for a certain period to get an idea of what their cash balance will be at the end of that period, right? So a forecast is generally done uh, 12 months into the future and uh, the cash flow is, is looked at on a month to month basis. So the aim of the cash flow is to say, you're gonna, you're gonna look at how much sales you're gonna bring in, how much cost you're gonna incur, other cash inflows and outflows that don't sort of show up on your p l and get an estimated sort of cash balance at the end right and this this estimated cash balance at the end of every period is a very very valuable number right so this brings me on to my next point why is it useful okay so like i said it helps a business owner predict any upcoming uh cash surpluses or cash deficits right and this will assist in the cash flow management sort of process so um, it's the, the cash flow forecasting is also a great tool um, in decision making in the business. So whether it be um, purchasing a new asset or, or equipment or bringing on a new staff member, uh, a cash flow forecast will give you a pretty good indication on whether your business can afford it and when they can afford it, right? And in the context of this webinar and dealing with economic downturn, um, you. you it, it, it is quite essential to do a cash flow forecast just so you know, you know, so you, as a business, you always, you don't want to think about it, but you want to prepare for the worst case scenario, right? So the worst case scenario is you run out of cash and you can no, no, no longer do business, right? So in, in, that, in that instance, you want to do a, a cash flow forecast so that you can predict when you will run out of cash as a business. And that will allow you time to put in contingency plans in place. So whether that be exploring your, your liquidity and, and um, potentially getting a loan or trying to raise investment to or other, other forms of cash injections, um, at least a cash flow forecast would be able to tell you um, when, if or when you need to do that, right? So you kind of just don't, you kind of just um, have a timeline of how long you can last, right? Before, you, before um, the worst case scenario um, hits. So yeah, so those are the those are the, the 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 main uses of the cash flow forecast, right? So how do you prepare a cash flow forecast? I'll go through this at a very high level. Um, you know, sort of, you know, 
let's let's for example let's say you're doing a cash flow forecast on a month to month basis right so your starting point will always be your opening cash balance at the beginning of that period right then you want to estimate your sales for uh, for that period right so the best way to do this is to look at historical data right so maybe potentially you look at the same year the same month last year as your starting point and then you would then adjust that figure um, based on any seasonal or industrial changes or any once off events that you're predicting within that period. Okay. And then you would estimate your cost for the period. So this is where you implement, you play around with those cost cutting strategies, right? Where you, you play around with figures. So if I cut these subscriptions, what they're going to look like. If I cut this, if I cut that, this is where you can do different scenarios of how much you need to cut and what the resulting cash balance would be. And then you also, you know, just outside of the PL, your income and expenses, you also have to look at any other um, cash inflows and outflows of the business. So for example, um, if you're paying GST you know, for a certain quarter or PAYG, or you're um, getting a cash injection via a loan or you're making loan repayments, these all affect the cash balance. So you need to account for these as well. And at the end of all this, what you should get is an estimated cash balance, right? So, and you do this month on month and, you should be able to track and see, get a pretty good idea of where your cash balance is going to be anywhere in the next twelve months. So, um, so that's 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 cash flow forecasting in a nutshell. Really, um, if you want if you want assistance with this, let us know. Contact us, and we'll we'll be able to help you build a cash flow forecast. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, James. That's really insightful, and I think the James's tip then on. The, the tax payments are always something that business owners tend to not factor in, the GST, the PAYG, the super. So um, that was a really good point, loan repayments. So these sort of things don't show up in the p and um, And I think if you're going to run your business effectively, you can't just look at your bank um, your bank account. So we, um, you know, we even we use a CFO and we do cash flow forecasting. That's how important it is. Um, we we find it absolutely critical to to managing your business cash flows, and we know the how important it is and the opportunities that come out of it. So when you're having a good grasp on where you're spending your money and why, you're getting really efficient capital allocation, and you're setting your business up to be as good as it can be, which is what what you want to get it to. Sorry, sorry, can we just go back to the previous slide, Ryan? Yeah. So there are a few basic sort of cash flow forecasting principles that I'd like to sort of say and advise on. So first of all, I I suggest that businesses review their cash their cash flow forecast every month, right? Because again, it is a forecast, and once a month is finished, you kind of want to see will this affect my ongoing forecast? And you, you should be making adjustments every month, right? Just to, you know, if you're not making adjustments, then your forecast kind of gets less and less accurate over time. So you want to keep that forecast as accurate as possible in order to have the best indication of a cash balance as possible. Right? And another thing I'd like to say is, you know, if you're operating a cash business and you're accounting for, for your sales and, and expenses on a cash basis, that's easy, right? But if you're dealing with credit terms, so if you're offering your customers credit terms on, on, the, on your invoices and you also have credit terms on your expenses, you kind of have to, it gets a bit more complex, so you have to account for that. So if you raise an invoice one month, but your credit terms are 30 days, that means you're not receiving the cash until next month. So you kind of need to account for when you predict you're going to collect the cash. Because otherwise, if you're doing it based on invoice invoice raise, that's not going to give you an accurate um, cash balance because we are it is a cash flow forecast, not a not a sort of an accrued uh, income forecast. So those, those would be my tips for, for doing a cash flow forecast. And there, and there are also plenty of um, uh, templates available online. So the, I've had, there's a great one on, uh, from NAB and obviously businessgov.au um, uh, have a great template as well. Um, base, basic template to help you sort of get started and thinking about um, forecasting and, and your cash flow. Awesome. Thanks, James. And yeah, obviously taking into account the, the increase in certain costs is really critical too. Um, and then I think the next sort of preparation tip is your business strategy for the next six to 12 months. Um, so you really need to define, um, you know, in this current market, like be a bit realistic and what, what, what within the industry you're operating within, what's, what's the current climate and what's the profitability looking like and where are the opportunities and are you, are you looking to grow? Um, are you looking to expand? 
are you in a defensive strategy and you want to just ride out the next 12 months and then once we're coming out of the the next year then you can start looking at the current climate and see if there's better opportunities then um, so you've really got to pick what is your business strategy for the next six to 12 months um, 12 months at a minimum but um, and your cash flow forecast should reflect that strategy um, and you really need to take into account the current market conditions to get an understanding of um, you know where you want to get to and how you're going to get there and just make sure it's realistic like if you're looking for hyper growth in this environment but the market's contracting um, you've got to take an honest look around you know what's the true cost going to be to to acquire those customers and take that market share um, because it might not be realistic so whilst your ambitions may be to, to grow very quickly, um, you know, the demand might not be there. So um, that's where you've got to speak with the right people, get the right advice, make sure you've got the right people around you so that you, you've got the right strategy and your sort of goals, ambitions, and your growth targets are in line with the reality of the current market and your acquisition costs to, to attain that growth or even maintain your current business operations, um, they're matching to that strategy. Yeah, exactly, Pat. Like when when during these times, it's always best to be a bit more conservative than you know optimistic. Um, you know, you, you you when you're doing a cash flow forecast, you'd rather be outperforming that than underperforming it, right? Because you know, underperforming uh, you know on a cash flow forecast will you know it, it means that um, you know you're going to have you're actually resulting in less cash than what your forecast is saying. So it is always best to sort of be conservative in these in this forecasting exercises. Definitely agree. Cool. Go to the next slide. I think this one's you, James. So we're going yeah, to so talk yeah, about a couple are, of there grants. Are different grants available um, right now. So we, we're talking. You know, there, there are hundreds of grants available to to um, to businesses in Australia, and you know there are federal grants and there are state grants as well. So you know, the, what we advise is you know the best thing to do is to sort of research what grants you have in your state and then also at the federal level. But the two main ones we're gonna talk about today are the export market development grants and the research and development tax offset. So the export market and development grant, what is it? It's a, it's a financial assistance program designed to help small to medium businesses um, start or expand their export journey. Okay, so the program is designed to expand the foreign markets for products, um, for Australian products by providing um, financial assistance for marketing and promotion activities. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly over the eligibility. The eligibility is actually quite complex. Um, there is a very stringent criteria in terms of who can get it and what products are eligible. Um, sorry, am I still a bit echoey? No, that's okay for me. Um, yeah. If it's like in, the, in the microphone, it sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Is, is that better? I'm just talking to the people in the chat. Yeah. Audio is fine. Thanks. Thanks. I'll, I'll try and minimize the echo. Sorry. Yeah. So in terms of eligibility, so just on a baseline level, to be eligible to get the Export Market Development Grant, you must be an Australian person. What does that mean? It means you are either a resident individual, an Australian company, or an Australian partnership or trust. And you must have an ABN in order to even apply for the grant. So you must be carrying on business. Okay, so that's the easy part, okay? The hard part is having an eligible product, okay? So the legislation um, actually lists the criteria for eligible products. So it, it is quite extensive. So I'll just go over it on a very high level. So essentially what the legislation is saying is the goods must be of Australian origin. So goods, goods that are manufactured and produced in Australia, right? So that's what essentially they're saying. And um, there are, there are, you can be eligible for goods that are produced outside of Australia, but they have extra sort of criteria that you need to meet before um, if you're going to, if you're going to try to get the grant on a product that's produced outside of Australia. Um, when we talk about services, the main service it would be tourism services that um, are provided in Australia to foreign um, foreign persons. There are other services that are included, but that, again, they also have to meet um, certain criteria. Um, and the the grant or you know, the definition of elder products it also covers events held in Australia, any intellectual property, 
software and other training expenses. So again, if you want full detail of the eligible products, um, I advise that you speak to speak to us or, or read the, the EMDG um, guidelines. So um, how much can you get? How much can this grant give you, right? So this, this grant is an eligibility-based demand-driven grant. So what that means is everyone who is eligible will get money, right? But the, the budget for this, this, this grant is fixed. So what that means is the more uh, eligible participants, that means the less each participant will get, participant will get in terms of funding, right? So um, yeah, it, it is it dependent on how many people apply in, in, in every certain round. Um, and I'll go through what the maximum grants are for each, each um, tier. So the way they do it is they, they, they issue the grants based on tiers and the tiers cater to businesses um, at different stages of their life cycle. So tier one um, is the two year grant agreement, um, which gives you a maximum grant of $15,000 per financial year. Okay. Um, tier two is a three year grant agreement, right? Which gives you a maximum of $24,600 per financial year. And the last, the last um, tier is tier three is a three year grant agreement with a maximum of $36,600 per financial year. So you can see that this, the, the EMDG is a maximum of eight years, right? You can earn the maximum time frame you can, you can claim for this, uh, you can get this grant is for eight years. So um, yeah, so on that point, again, I've given you the maximum grant funds you can get, but it is based on how much expenditure you are you are doing in your business to promote your product, right? So the EMDG is only designed to cover 50% of eligible expenditure. So if you have spent $10,000, for example, on marketing your product, the EMDG will only um, give you um, sort of uh, $5,000 as a, as a reimbursement. That's it. So it's not, it's not just, it's, they're, not, they're not just giving you money to go and spend. You have to spend the money first and then you fill out a report and your milestone payment uh, milestone reports and then they'll they'll approve it and then they'll give you back 50 percent rebate so that's how it works um then how to apply um yeah so it's the the process has actually been uh, quite streamlined um it's a it's an online application through the M emdg portal on the austrade website so um yeah if you if you want assistance with this because the legislation is quite is quite complex um, speak to us and we'll point you in the right direction um, on who to talk to, to to sort of strengthen your claim and get all your evidence together to, to apply for this grant. Because when you go through the application process, um, there is a lot of documentation and evidence that is required in order to, to, to upload an application. So yeah, we definitely advise speaking to a professional um, in order to strengthen your, your um, application. And um, so currently round two for this grant is open and it closes on the 17th of August. So, uh, you know, less than a month to go until the application is closed for this round. Awesome. <clears throat> that was a pretty thorough overview. So thanks, James. So we've had clients in the past claiming these and they're pretty good. So if you've got, if you're basically, if you're selling goods and services overseas, you should look into whether you should be claiming this, this grant um, so do you, do you sell to overseas? I suppose that'd be the first question. Um, and then if you do, then you should look into it. And, and, and there's some good things like you could claim, um, I know historically people have claimed like travel expenses. So going overseas to, to look at locations and things like that. So get a, a bit of travel reimbursed um, and setting up operations overseas. It might be, um, you know, warehouse or warehouse manager overseas. So it does cover quite a few things. So it's definitely, worthwhile looking into if you're selling goods and services um, overseas. So thanks for that, James. I'll talk quickly about the R&D grant. So this is a quite common one um, to, to be able, it's, it's basically a grant that is incentivizing um, innovation. So research and development. And so if your business is basically creating something new within the market that's, that's not there, um, you might be eligible for this grant. It's a, it's a tax rebate. So you, so basically it's a, um, it's, it's a, you get a percentage of the expenses paid refunded when you lodge a tax return. Um, 
And to be eligible, you need to be a company. So you need to be incorporated. Um, so that's a key part. You need to have spent $20,000 in eligible activities. So they've got a list of activities and what is an eligible activity. So it's, it's based on principles of, of established science, right? So um, you basically need to do a hypothesis um, from hypothesis to experiment where you um, do the observation and evaluation and it leads to logical conclusions. So it's kind of like a scientific experiment. So um, if you're creating something new, it might be a new bit of software that's not currently in the market and there's nothing in the market to work out how to do it. You basically need to show that you're testing how to create something new. And to be honest, you need to sort of show that you're failing at it. Like there's gonna be a risk that you might not succeed. And that's a really key part to the R&D grant. And you might be brewing a new, new, um, a new alcoholic beer, it could be anything, right? So it covers quite a wide range of things, but um, basically you've got to be creating something new. It's got to be innovative. It's not in the market now. Um, and you've got to be doing activities and having evidence backing up that you're doing basically this high, this, this science principle-based experiment to work out if it's even feasible, right? Um, and the rebate is, it's it's a 18 and a half percent on top of the company tax rate. So it's 43 and a half percent. So say you spend um, 100K in eligible R&D expenditure, you get back 43 and a half K and things that it can cover is wages as well. So you might have, um, you might need to hire people to, to do, um, you know, to, to, to work on whatever you're doing. And you can claim back 43 and a half percent of their wage if it all relates to R&D. Usually not all of it will, but a lot of it might. So, um, so it's, a, it's a good way for the government to encourage um, research and innovation and creating new products. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good grant. We've got a lot of clients that get it. Um, basically, if you think you're doing something that hasn't been done before, I think that's probably the easiest way to think of it. If you're doing something that's not currently in the market, if you're good or service, if you look at what you're doing and you go, this isn't available and you're having to create something, um, then I would get in touch just to see if the, your activities and your business lines up to the eligible criteria and you might have a claim um, as well. So the benefits are that you do get that um, tax offset. So it's a really good way to fund um, your research within your business and your innovation within your business, because a lot of that stuff is generally sunk costs and it's expensive. And when you're sort of trying to tap into new markets, there might not be an established customer base to tap into. So the government's trying to, um, you know, provide you with some funds so that you can create something new and you might be able to, you know, take that international as well, which which is another potential requirement. So can it can it break into other markets? Um, so that's the R and D grant. If you think you're creating something new that's not currently available in, in the market, um, get in touch, and um, we'll 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 point you in the right direction. And then I think just following on from that, um, if you want to go to the next slide, the, the as James mentioned, there's literally over 700 grants, and so obviously to cover them all would, would take forever. And some of them are really niche, right? They're really niche to a particular area. So there's a lot of regional grants. Um, there's a lot of industry specific grants. Um, so there's, there's tons of grants and you could, there's a tool that you can use to see which grants you might be eligible for. Um, the two big ones, are the, the R&D grant and the export grant, they're, they're quite common. Um, there's also, some really common state grants as well for startups that are quite common as well, but um, they do have application processes. They aren't easy to get. So the export grant and the R&D grant are a bit more assured if you meet the criteria, whereas some of the other grants, um, you've got to get lucky. You've got to have a really good application and they basically have a limited number of people that they'll accept and it comes down to your application versus someone else's application. So they're a bit more difficult to, to get those grants. Awesome, pass it over to, to Ryan to chat about um, how, we, how Law Path can help and how POP can help. And also we'll get to the FAQ and we'll answer as many questions as we can um, at the end. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Pat. Really, really informative. And thank you, James, as well, uh, for going through that. Now, I just wanted to link back to how LawPath can help. I know at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we spoke about um, the stigma that exists within uh, small businesses around accessing legal and also accounting advice. Um, so a recent study that we did found that 80% of individuals and 87% of small to medium businesses uh, find it difficult to access the legal and accounting services that they need because there, again, there's this perception that it takes a long time, uh, it's expensive and it's complicated. And that's where LawPath comes in um, with our contract management. Like I said as well, uh, we have the 350 different templates available for your business. Uh, we've got personalized workflows. Um, so again, whether you're looking to, to collect a debt, to register a trademark, uh, to set up a family trust, all these different things that have a very close link with accounting. Um, you can get the legal and the non-legal steps to ensure your compliance. And then lastly, uh, booking in the legal consultations. Um, so you can always speak to lawyers on demand uh, and also accountants. So you know, if you've loved what um, with Pat and James have both shared today, um, it's simple and super easy to book in a consultation to speak with them. Let's say you wanna talk about the EMDG grant or there's uh, some budgeting or some forecasting questions that you have, um, super, super easy, and you can usually speak to them within uh, one to two business days. So I just wanted to jump onto our plans and how we can help um, with everything. So on the left-hand side, we've got our essentials plan. Now, what this is, is simply access to our 350 plus legal templates. So you can access them. You can use e-signature and send them out. So you have the end-to-end -end process completed. Um, you can white label it with your business's branding. So you can pop on your logo, your business's name. Um, it's pretty cool. You can also add up to three users. So it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, but then we have the legal advice plan, which is um, the essentials coupled with on-demand legal advice. So you can get unlimited 30-minute calls uh, with our lawyers on new legal matters to talk about um, you know, things to do with, say, intellectual property or business structure. And again, there is always a close link with accounting, uh, particularly when it comes to these things uh, around, say, uh, compliance and business structure. So that is our legal advice plan. It also does offer contract review up to four pages. So if you do have templates that you want to get reviewed uh, and go through, our lawyers are more than happy to go through them. Um, and then obviously we've got our legal and accounting advice plan. So again, it includes everything that the legal advice plan includes, including the documents, um, but it does provide on-demand accounting and tax advice. Um, so again, if you've enjoyed what Pat and James have shared today and you find that this could be super relevant to what you're going through, um, not just the topics of say budgeting and forecasting, but if you have questions on say payroll processing or using your accounting software such as MYOB, or just doing a comprehensive uh, health check of your business structure and your accounting. Um, it's a great plan to go on. Um, they also offer uh, ASIC and ATO agent service. So that's something that we offer here at LawPath. If you require company changes to be made um, or things on your behalf, then our company's team can offer to be your agent. And obviously if you require additional work, um, there is discounts available on this plan. So this plan is an advice plan. Um, James and Pat and the team at POP they're highly qualified chartered accountants who can provide a high level, high level advice on your business. Uh, but if you do require additional services from your current accountant, such as bookkeeping or BAS returns to be put in, um, it can definitely assist you with that process as well. So I just wanted to go a bit more into the legal and accounting advice. Uh, the plan itself, we do have a structured accelerator program. Now this is currently being offered free of charge uh, for members. And what it is, is that the team at Pop Business They'll sit down with you uh, and take a comprehensive look at your accounting uh, across, say, the 12 months that you're on the plan. Um, so there's six different topics you can see here, which is, again, you've got payroll processing and reporting. Um, it can help you look through, uh, you know, basic tax minimization structures, particularly at the time of, you know, doing your returns and preparing for that. It can do a general review of group structuring um, focused on asset protection and tax minimization. Uh, they can obviously give you ongoing accounting and tax support. So again, the bookkeeping, income tax, uh, deductions and deductibility, uh, understanding GST and reporting requirements. So making sure that you put your BAS lodgings in on time and pay that money to the ATO. And then lastly, on internal accounting and tax processes um, to ensure that you have accurate reporting and lodgement. So this is particularly beneficial and relevant to what 
um, Pat and James spoke about today on forecasting and budgeting. Um, because again, as much as you have a lot going on in the business, you want to ensure that you, you can put the money aside and know where your business sits for things like GST, PAYG, uh, superannuation, year-end tax, monthly reporting, and most importantly, budgeting the cash flow to meet those liabilities as they fall due. So today's special offer, um, the pricing page, normally we charge $293 a month for this plan. Um, and even at that price point, it's incredible value uh, for unlimited 30 minute calls with pop business on new accounting matters. Um, so again, you can book in a call uh, on anything that they've spoken about today, as well as a bunch of different other issues that you want advice on. Uh, but for everyone on today's webinar, we have an exclusive offer. Um, instead of $293 a month, we're running a three-month trial on this plan at just $199 a month. So again, just for the $199 a month, you'll get access to unlimited 30-minute calls with our lawyers. You also get access to unlimited 30-minute calls with our accountants um, here at Pop Business. Uh, and they'll go through um, you know, all these different things, including what I mentioned in that accelerator program. So they can do a comprehensive overview of your business from an accounting standpoint. You get access to all the legal documents and the templates alongside our e-signature as well. So if you'd like to take advantage of this special offer, uh, I know that a few people have commented saying the chat is disabled. Um, the Q&A box, which is there and it's private, uh, key in your name, your best contact phone number, and uh, the team here at LawPath or myself will give you a call um, after today's webinar and uh, get you set up. But more importantly, we'll answer any questions that you might have uh, on this plan, what it includes and how it can help your business. Um, or perhaps you're a LawPath customer with us, you're on a subscription and you just want to you know, pause your current subscription and, and really give this a go. Um, because again, there's no better time of year to be reviewing your legals and your accounting than right now. Uh, in these inflationary times, you've got tax returns happening. Um, you know, you're looking to turbocharge your business for the final six months of the year, um, or kick off the financial year on a good start. So again, if you'd like to take advantage of the offer, um, key in your name and your best contact phone number in the Q&A box, and uh, our team will give you a call right after this. So I'm going to pass it back to James and Pat now for some Q&A and ask me anything. So again, feel free to uh, pop in your questions in the Q&A box, and uh, we'll take it from there. Awesome. I'll just, and I'll just... Yeah, I'll just add to that. Like we, you know, accountants and lawyers aren't, aren't cheap, to be honest. And to, you know, it, it can go up to, you know, plus more than $500 to $600 an hour. So to get unlimited advice from us and Damon and the LawPath team um, for that price is, is, you know, you'll get a ton of value. And, um, you know, I always say it like the businesses that we're working with regularly and speak to you know, more regularly, they definitely are doing the best than businesses that we don't speak to. And the ones that want to get advice and want to speak to us, um, they're just setting their most important asset up to succeed. And, and that's not a sales pitch. That's literally, you know, that's the fact of the matter. So if you want to speak to experts and get expert advice to put your business forward, um, definitely recommend just, just trialing it and, um, you know, getting that expert advice to put your business in the best position to succeed. Um, especially as, as Ryan mentioned, especially in this changing landscape. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to James here because he's um, done a fantastic job with the budgeting. So the first question is, um, a, a good question is, what is the best way to start budgeting for my business? Where do I begin? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I, I think the best way to start budgeting for your business is, I think uh, you kind of have to look at it from a, a period standpoint. So right now, we're on 20th of July, right? We kind of, you kind of have to see, okay, you've got 10 days left in the month, kind of sort of predict how much income and expenses you're going to bring um, in the next 10 days. And you want to see if you are profitable in that period, right? So do an estimate because, but doing the forecasting, and the budgeting, you want to, you want to look at, you want to look at in the future, right? You're not really focused on the past. The past will dictate how you forecast and how you project, but you are looking towards the future, right? So, um, sort of get an idea of whether or not you will be profitable this month and then start next month with your forecast in term and using this data from the previous month um, to set your projections for sales. And, and, and then this is where you sort of employ those cost reduction strategies. So look at all the costs in your business and say, okay, in July, you know, what was, what, what's absolutely necessary and what are the things I can cut, right? And then in your forecast exercise, you cut those expenses from the forecast and see what that effect that has on your cash balance. 
So it, it is a bit of playing around, but it is it is a very you know worth it exercise to do, especially during these 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 times of downturn. Um, yeah, the, you, what you want to know is you know how long you can be in business for without without putting in a, a contingency plan, right? And uh, yeah, it's definitely you kind of have to change your mindset of looking to the future and actually crunching those numbers to see um, where you're going to be in six to ten months because. You know, like, like Pat said, inflate this inflation, inflationary pressure, it, it could be around for six to 12 months. So you want to plan for this time. Um, and yeah, and the best way to do that, again, is to sort of look at your, your past results and then and use those past results um, to then sort of plan for your future. Yeah, so. great, great answer. And, and, and especially take, take close consideration to your most recent months. So if you ran your profit and loss, say, in your, your accounting software on a monthly basis, um, then you'll see what your past profit and loss, like your income and expenses look like for the past, say, six to 12 months. And but particular, take close attention to, I think James mentioned earlier, the one-offs. So one of those big lumpy ones going to come out because you don't want to get caught out. And then also um, your last few months, if you've got recurring expenses, should be a really good guide around you know, what's regularly coming out, um, you know, what's your wages, um, you always start with your knowns. So, you know, you use the, the cost. Your rent, of, your wages, exactly. um, yeah, things like that. Um, you know, if you're paying, you know, for an accountant on a monthly basis, things that are fixed and uh, sort of subscription based, those are you going to going to be your starting points. And then you kind of look at your previous months and sort of maybe take an average or a close number because, you know, generally expenses, they don't vary that much month to month. Of course, there will be some months where um, some expense, expenses increase, but you know, generally month to month, they're quite on par with each other. So it, it is it is quite easy to sort of do the expenses side of things. But I think the harder bit would be the income side, predicting and projecting your income because you just don't know, you know, if people are going to buy your product or your good or service, right? So yeah, I think I think the, the expenses side is easy, um, but the the cost the the income projection will be a bit tougher, I think. Yeah, and you might have a little bit of complexity in your variable costs as well. So if you've got different levels of sales, that might drive different variable costs within your business. So you fix, as James said, you've got your fixed costs, your rent. You might have some wages that are on salary. You might have um, subscriptions and bits and pieces, but then you might have direct costs that are associated directly to your sales, and that could be you're selling a good and you've got transfer fur costs. You might have to buy goods. You might have um, you know, contractors that you use to deliver X, Y, Z. So um, yeah, so start with your knowns, look at your previous six to 12 months, look at what the price increases are looking like to factor in the buffer. Um, you be a bit more conservative with your sales. Definitely don't say you're going to have massive growth and um, if, if you're not sure of that. So um, in a good forecast, you'll have drivers. So what's driving your sales? Um, and that could be leads. And then you're like, well, where am I getting my leads from? Um, and so you'll have different, you know, you might be paying for ads, you might be doing marketing activities. So you have some revenue drivers, um, but in general, you might be able to just use some, some average sales based on seasonality or previous months. So if your sales are pretty um, constant, it might be quite easy. Or if they're seasonal, you might be able to look back in prior periods um, but yeah, just the starting point is looking at the historical data, having a template to fill in. And then obviously, um, if you can get, get advice on whether it looks accurate based on, you know, the market conditions and the industry sort of benchmarks as well. Yeah. Like, like for example, Pat and myself would be able to look at a cash flow forecast and, and see if it makes sense from a number standpoint quite easily. We've seen enough of them. Yeah. And we, you know, we can run, we can do certain calculations to see, you know, if certain projections and per, certain costs make sense, you know, for example, we could look at the, the profit margin of a product and see why is it, you know, why is it changing from month to month and things like that. So it is, it is quite, um, it is, it can get quite technical, but it is good to get it right you know, in order to get the most accurate cash projection, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and the next question I think James is for you again. Yep. Um, this might be something that um, it's it's a generalization one. So it's, um, sorry, it's a specific one. Are there any limitations on the type of products the export grant um, applies to? Uh, so in terms of in terms of, uh, no, so what the legislation actually says is as long as it's a good or service, produce in Australia, right? So you're sort of 
producing it in Australia and exporting it overseas. So clothing and food would definitely be included. Um, and yep. then, um, yeah, and then the, there, are, there are other things that are, that are included as well that you might not even think. So for example, software or, or intellectual property or events held in Australia, right? So those sort of things are also eligible products, but yeah, definitely the two easy ones, clothing and food, definitely. As long as it's, you know, as long as it, it meets the eligibility of Australian, you know, primar primar primarily produced in Australia, then it should be an eligible product. Cool. Okay. Um, moving on. Uh, next question. So we have a question. How do I allocate my surplus money from last month slash end of financial year? Um, okay. I'm, I, this question is a bit hard to interpret. So if you have surplus cash in the bank, um, that just rolls over from period to period because it sits in your balance sheet, right? So um, what I would do with surplus money is ensure you have enough put away to meet any upcoming liabilities. So things like GST, PAYG and, and super, because we know that these things are not due on a monthly basis, right? Most of them, you, so they could be for your, for your, for your BAS and activity statements, but generally they're on a quarterly basis and, and your super is also on a quarterly basis. So if you have ex surplus cash, make sure you have enough put away to meet those liabilities and what is, whatever's left over would, you can use that, you can, you could, that's for you to use in the business. So you could use that to purchase, um, you know, more, more equipment or, or, you know, bring on more staff, you know, it, it's your, it's your, it's there for you to use, but as long as you're not using all the cash left over without taking into account any upcoming liabilities. Yep. Good answer. And I think like a general rule of thumb is to leave a few months of cash flow if you can in your business, a few months of expenses so that you can handle these downturns. So definitely don't spend all your money. And, you know, each, um, each, each month, what will happen is when you have a closing cash balance that rolls into your opening cash balance. So your opening cash equals closing cash from the last month. And you, you're really your cash flow, you're really keeping an eye on that closing and opening cash and making sure it never goes negative. Yeah, sorry, just another point. Another, another, another sort of cash outflow that people don't really think about because it doesn't occur during the year is the income tax, right? So, you know, if, if you're, if you're making profit in your company, you will have to pay company tax at the, at the corporate rate, which is 25%, but that happens once a year. So you kind of also have to budget for that throughout the year to, so that you don't get hit with a massive tax bill at the end of the year, if you are profitable, right? So a, a general rule of thumb I like to say is, you know, you run a monthly p &L, whatever your profit is, take 25% of that, put that away in a savings account. At least that way you will then um, have, if not all, at least some of the, the tax money when it comes due. Awesome. That's a great tip. And yeah, we get so many clients get caught out with that and they don't budget for the income tax and then they get a big lumpy bill and get shocked and thinking that any profit in their business is theirs to keep and spend without factoring in income tax. And that's why it's so important to do the cash flow so you can um, budget that upcoming expense in and not overspend during the year. Um, should, I've got a question for you, James. Should I adjust spending limits for the month ahead for my business or go with the flow and determine it based on expenditure? Uh, I, th I think definitely, well, it depends on what position, what position you're in now, right? If you are, if you're saying this month I'm making a loss, I mean, that means you've spent more money than you've made, right? So I think it would be good to sort of start looking, start adjusting the spending limits for the month ahead. Um, going with the flow doesn't really, um, is not really a, a strategy. I think, I think that's, just, that's just poor planning, in my opinion. I think, yeah, definitely look at the month, look at month to, the month ahead and the months ahead as well um, to, to see, you know, if you put spending limits on, Will this, will this, will this result in you having a, a positive cash balance for the, for that month? So, um, you know, if if you if you know, so again, it, it is really dependent on your business and how you are performing um, in this month, and then that should really sort of dictate whether or not you need to, if you even need to um, put in spending limits or not for the months ahead. Yep, awesome answer, and I think just even taking a, a different angle, um, we're saying yeah, you definitely always want to have positive cash and. Um, you know, you definitely can burn money to grow and that's quite fine. That's a strategy some businesses do and they raise capital and they need to grow to get to the next round and that's totally fine too. Um, but that's why it's so important to have a cash flow forecast so that you're um, accountable for your 
um, growth plan and you're not, you don't have wastage in your expenses. So making sure that you're um, tracking your expenses and they're tying to your growth um, and you're measuring, um, you know, the, the, the financial, you know, you're measuring the, the cost of attaining clients and the cost of growing as well, because it's really, really important. And that's something that, that you know, a, a detailed cash flow plan and forecast will have because you'll have a lot of, um, you know, the more, more, you can make it quite complex and you can have, um, you know, hiring models for employees based on certain metrics. And that might be um, leads per salesperson, or it might be um, marketing activities that you want to do tying back to your business strategy. Um, so you might want to invest X percent of the capital raised in X. And then to do that, you might then have a hiring strategy to hire different people to do different activities. Um, but having a cash flow forecast, um, costs can just come up and get out of hand very easily. So it's really important that you're accountable to your forecast and you're reviewing it on a regular basis. So even if you're burning cash and, and that's your strategy to grow, that's fine too. But just making sure you, you've got your forecast in place and you've got a keen eye on it and you're reviewing it regularly and updating it regularly. Yeah, yeah. Like just reiterate, reiterating on that point. Yeah, it is very important to keep reviewing your cash flow forecast. It's, you know, you might've heard of, um, you know, budgeting, which is sort of like a budget analysis where you set goals for every month and then you see if your actual results match your budget. I don't think that's a very useful exercise uh, because what happens if you don't meet a budget, you kind of move on and go into the next period, but a cash flow forecast, at least, yeah, it adds a level of accountability. You know, you, you're, you're trying to achieve a certain cash balance in your accounts um, and that, you know, that, that cash balance will um, help you, well, well, that cash, that indi indicated cash balance will help you make decisions for the future. So yeah, definitely, definitely um, keep an eye on that cash flow forecast. It's an ongoing process. It's not, it's not, it's not just a one a thing you do once and then you, you just leave it there. It, it, it does need constant adjusting. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is like, what areas should I cut back on? Um, get in touch with us. It's different for every business. Um, every business is unique and we wouldn't say cut back on a certain expense without having a really good understanding of where your business is heading and what are your goals and what's your cash, cash balance and what's your business strategy. So um, that's a really complex question to say, what should I cut back on? Uh, I.e. should I reduce wages in Australia and outsource it to save costs? Should I um, buy different products? If, yeah. You know, should I cut subscriptions? You know, like it's, it's a really, um, it's a question that requires really deep thought um, and you don't want to cut something that's going to affect your ability to service your current clients or potentially future clients. Um, and you also got to think about the team, the culture. You got to think about a lot of things. You got to think about the quality of the product where you where yeah, do you fit within yeah. the market? Yeah, it's very, very complex. factors there as well, not just your, your quantitative. There's a lot of qualitative factors that need to, yeah, exactly like Pat said, you know, team culture, company culture, things like that. They do, you know, they are, they are sort of intangible, but they do have a financial effect in one way or another. So um, definitely a very personalized and very niche, individualized sort of question for each client. It's not a very general um, question we can answer. So yeah, get in touch with us. Yeah. And yeah, um, We've got another question, so um, we'll just do a couple more and we'll wrap it up because we're conscious of time and um, we know you're all quite busy. Um, we're an NFP. We're just wondering with the volatile climate, how best to budget when unsure of whether funding would continue or not? Um, and I think that's a great question and that's just where you just need to start. You need to put something in and you need to look at where were you getting your past um, monies from? Um, what's the probability of getting monies from there in the future? What's your strategy going forward to get additional funding? What's your current cost structure? Um, what's, what are your cost centers? Um, and look, again, really personalized, would need to review your business and then get an understanding of where, we, where you see the future going and then where we think it might be matching as well. And then from there, you can discuss strategies with us to work out um, you know, the solution to that, but it's, um, as we answered above, it's very, it's, it's per each business and, um, you know, forecasting income is difficult. It's not easy to forecast income because it depends on the different drivers within your business and how those drivers are performing. And in a contracting market, it's even harder. Um, and so whether you're going to get funding for NFP, 
um, not for profits, um, when there's going to be a bit less cash around and business are going to tighten their belts a little bit. Um, how do you forecast that? Well, you know, you got to look at where you were getting the income from previously. That's your first point of call. And then what's your strategy to get income future? And then you can build a plan around that. Um, I think the last question that we'll answer is um, my business, I registered my business last week. What are my legal obligations towards ASIC tax? Um, are there any grants available? I think for the grants, click on the link with those 700 plus grants to just review um, what grants are available for disability support services. And then I think for the, um, you know, if you're new to business, we really recommend you getting um, on the legal and accounting advice plan so you can get um, get these, these questions answered. So your obligations might be different based on your entity type, how big you are, what industry you're in. So that it's quite complex. So I strongly recommend if you're sort of just navigating this new world, um, you speak to, to us to work out um, what you should be doing. Yeah, exactly. There's, you know, if you never run a business before, there is a lot that you probably won't know in terms of legal and accounting and tax compliance. So yeah, it, it, yeah, like Pat said, it is a whole new world and you do want to make sure that you are compliant. So, you know, sign on, you know, we do advise that you sign on with the, uh, the legal and accounting advice plan and we can, we can, we can give you everything that you need to, to do and, and, and learn in terms of operating a new business in order to stay compliant um, with the government bodies. Awesome. I think, yeah. Cool. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks everyone for, for joining. It was, um, I hope you got, got, a, got a lot out of the webinar. Um, I'll let Ryan touch base. I think we've, we've got a recording available and you'll have access to the slides. Do you want to close it off, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Pat and James, for your presentation today. Now, um, again, we will make a recording of the presentation available as well as a copy of the slides. Um, so if there's any further questions, uh, or you're interested in taking up the offer, or you have uh, further questions for Pat and James at Pop Business, um, again, last chance to type in the Q&A box, just type in yes. Um, you don't have to put your contact details in, and uh, one of the team will give you a call this afternoon. Um, you can also send me an email. We've got a company phone number or live chat on the website as well. But again, really just wanted to thank everyone for taking time out of your day. Um, and again, thank Pat and James again from Pop Business. They've been fantastic. And we will be holding a series of uh, webinars next week as well uh, and into next month on different accounting issues so that you can stay compliant and up to date with what's happening. So thank you everyone for attending and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.